Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Good afternoon, or I say good morning for um, all the colleagues who are joining from, um, from the US and the, to the patients. So um, I would first maybe like to introduce myself. So my name is Nicole Lindenblatt and, and I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon and a microsurgeon. Um, currently at the University Hospital in Zurich. Um, I've been a plastic surgeon for 15 years now. I'm also a general surgeon. This is what I did before. And I'm, I'm specialized uh, in microsurgery, super microsurgery, and um, especially lymphatic surgery. And today um, I would like to talk about some new developments that we um, have now, in, especially in reconstructive microsurgery. So it's a robotic um, assisted microsurgery. And this also has some impl implications for maybe different operations we can offer in the future or make it maybe easier to offer this operation. So I'm gonna talk about central lymphatic surgery and also the peripheral lymphatic surgery. So let me first, okay. Okay, uh, of course, um, thank all the sponsors. Um, for the LEARN Symposium series. And um, this is also a disclaimer I'm gonna show you from the network. Um, these are my disclosures. So I've been working closely with the company that, uh, that is constructing the robot I'm going to talk about. Um, yeah, let me start by saying that um, actually it's a little bit back to the roots always with, with, with surgery and also with reconstructive surgery. So. Um, there were people that discovered the lymphatic system uh, more than 400 years ago, like um, Gaspare Asselli, who, who lived in uh, Milan at that time in Italy. And he did um, like dissections on animals and on, do on dogs. And he found that they have like milky vessels in their, in their gut. And um, this was a, a different kind of vessel he discovered and he described it. He wrote a dissertation about it. And um, he was the first person to really see the lymphatic vessels and to describe it. And lymphatic surgery has also circles. It comes back and we always have better, better methods to do it. So there was a time like in the middle of the last century where a lot of lymphatic surgery was done also on the central lymphatic system. It was tried to you know, reconstruct the thoracic duct, but maybe not the best um, yeah, methods were there and also not the instruments and robotics and computer and microscopes that we have now. So it sort of got forgotten and now it's coming back and we have new possibilities to really work on this system. So um, there is the, the lymphatic system, it's everywhere in the body. I'm sure you're all aware of it. So there is this periphery of the arms and legs and also the head. And then um, there it's very superficial. And then in the central, the center of the body, the, the abdomen and the thorax, it's really deep within the body. So it really runs really close to the pelvis, the bone and the spine, not, not really easy accessible uh, for surgery at the moment. And that's probably also a reason why we're not doing so much surgery there. So it's sort of forgotten or it got forgotten over time that you could actually maybe also do something there. And um, it actually returns most of the fluid of the body into the bloodstream. It's not mostly the venous system as thought previously, it's really the lymphatic system that's taking up more, more than 90% of the interstitial fluid. And that's why it's also so important. And it also transports the fatty acids from the digestive system, from the um, intestine and the bowel, chylus, in, back into the venous bloodstream. So it's very important also to take up fatty acids and nutrients. So if that's not working, which can happen if you have a problem with the central lymphatic system, that's a big problem for the patient because they lose protein and um, really are malnourished. And it's very important also for immune defense. So you can get a lot of infections um, if it's not working properly. So in general, in my view, there are two pathologies. So we often deal with the congestion. So that would be lymphedema. So it doesn't flow, um, it's clogged or it's uh, dissected by operations. 
And the other big problem that I'm not going to talk about too much today, it's a leakage. So if it's transacted in the wrong place and you don't want to transact it, you can get a really, really severe leakage of this large amount of fluid that is circulating through the body and you get lymphocele, seroma, lymphatic fistulas. And some patients have it for years before anyone can treat it because the lymphatic vessels are so small, small and nobody knows how to access it. So I'm a um, reconstructive microsurgeon. So for us, it's a lot of work with the microscope because the lymphatic vessels are really small, usually less than one millimeter. And um, the question really was, so we have robotic surgery for um, visceral surgeons, thoracic surgeons. You probably all know the Da Vinci system. So you can see it here. It has been established also in urology for tumor resection over the past 10 to 15 years. So it's used but it's not really suitable to use it for microsurgery because the instruments are too big and also the handling, it's not really intuitive for microsurgeon. I will show you that later because you hold the instruments differently as a microsurgeon. So the question really was, um, is it possible to have a robot also for microsurgery? So currently there are two systems on the market. The first one um, was the Musa system or the one that was published first. Um, it's a robot that was uh, designed in the Netherlands by a, a group of um, surgeons at the university. And then the second one is the Sumani surgical system that you can see here. And it also has been designed a long time ago. Uh, I was first involved probably around 2018-19 and um, it also has a CE mark. It doesn't have, from what I know, at least at the moment, the FDA approval yet, but it will, it will have it soon, probably. So this is the system. It has uh, the instruments, as you can see here, the so-called nano wrists, and they're really small wrists with seven degrees of freedom with a thin shaft and tips, really small, three millimeters. And these um, can be used as your microsurgical instruments. There are dilators and um, needle holders and the ro robot can be transitioned into the operating field and can be operated by the surgeon uh, who is sitting on this chair and it will pick up your movements uh, like exactly the movements you do and will translate it um, into the operative field. Here's a little closer look. These are single use instruments um, and they have also a motion scaling technology, which means it will slow down the movement, but also take out any kind of tremor or extra movement. So it makes it very, very stable and also a little bit slower, of course. So if you have a 20 times motion scaling, it's really slow. You have the feeling it's slow, but seven almost feels like it's doing your actual movements at the moment. So the robotic system is one thing. It has, it, at, the, at the moment, it also needs an additional visualization system. So it's not integrated into the robot yet. So the, the first thing you can use, of course, is the microscope. Um, it has, in my view, the best magnification for lymphatics still. Um, because it's an optical microscope and this is really has the best resolution for the spin structures, but it's not doesn't offer the full benefit because you have to still sit behind the microscope. I can show you later what it looks like and have the robot sort of moved into it, you have to have a folding tube because it may be too short otherwise to reach and you're really sitting between the robotic arms and trying to squeeze in behind the microscope. It's possible, but it's not really the I think the full benefit benefit we should um, um, aspire to have in the future. So there are 3D visualization systems, so-called exoscope, that's the second option, and probably also the future option, but it has to be improved. So at the moment, it's fine for blood vessels, for sure, um, for really like thick vessels, but for translucent vessels like lymphatics, it can be difficult to see because it's doesn't have the depth perception, depends a little bit on the system. So we have a system, a microscope that has an integrated exoscope and there it's possible, but um, still the microscope, I would say it's better, but this has a lot of room for improvement. And of course, then it's more comfortable for the surgeon because you can sit on a chair, you can sit freely in the room and you can just operate and look at the screen with a 3D, uh, 3D glasses. So um, the Sumani system by now has two kinds of um, instrument sets. So it's available for microsurgery, which are the bigger on the right, 
and also for Supermicro, those are the smaller instruments on the left. And they're about half the size of the bigger instrument. That's what you can calculate. And they also have a cutting function. Um, at the moment, the micro, micro needle holder has a cutting fu function, which is really helpful. When you're on your own in an area that's not easy to access, you can just suture and cut yourself. That's really helpful. So we have been able to be one of the first hospitals to work with the Sumani in the clinics. And we got it actually in July, 2021. And um, here you can see, we of course did a lot of training in the skills lab um, where we worked on little plastic tubes and sutured them as you can see here. So that's in the lab and on the left, can see these manipulators that you operate with and you can also you are sterile at the table actually um, and can use it like you would use forceps and needle holders for microsurgery and it's translated here to the to the robot on the right um, yeah so what did we use it for already so in general it's possible to use it on free flaps um, the vessels are quite big so um, it's possible I don't know if, we'll be, if it will be necessary if you have really the two or three millimeter vessels. Of course, if the plan would be to go smaller, to even dissect perforators only, for example, in a deep slab, make everything smaller, then it's really an advantage. So that would be probably something for the future to use on free flaps, but to get less invasive and only dissect perforators and then do sec more secure perforator to perforator anastomosis. Um, it's also very nice for head and neck reconstruction. All kinds of flaps are possible, especially if it's maybe a deeper wound where you not, cannot reach really with your hands, so it's uncomfortable, it helps. And of course, for extremity reconstruction or even nerve co-optation, uh, you can use it. So we used it mostly in the beginning for um, lymph, um, lymphatic surgery, so for lymphovenous anastomosis and lymph node transfer. But um, it's actually used for everything by now. We have also now attendings using the system by now, five attendings. So in the beginning, it was just me using it and my colleague, we were doing lymphatic surgery, but now uh, about all the team and the attendings are using it and it really works well. So they also have a really steep learning curve. So first we really wanted to compare it to hand anastomosis because we had the feeling it may be slower, maybe more complicated. The learning curve would be really difficult. So just to give you an impression, on the left side is the robot and on the right side is the hand. So this is an early video. You can also see it, it sometimes can be difficult to pull on the sutures. Um, but in general, the learning curve is quite steep. I will show later. And this is also on the lymphatic vessel. Um, on the left side is the robot. On the right hand is inside the hand, um, it's both in real time, and the robot, it's really nice and stable. I would say that's the main advantage. If you want to do a stitch or you want to tie the knot, you just have a really good feeling of stability. Um, so these are some of the uh, anastomosis we did. So it's a lymphatic to a vein with a nice washout done by the robot, a size mismatch, lymph node flaps, normal arterial anastomosis, uh, lympholymphatic anastomosis, um, preventive um, lymphovenous anastomosis after sarcoma resection. Here, I think it, it really helped because it's not so easy to do microsurgery in this deep wound because you cannot rest your arms, so you feel kind of uncomfortable. So with the robot, it was really nice and stable. And this is actually the learning curve. So in the beginning, it's it's kind of tough, I would say, because you with the robot you don't feel anything i don't know if i mentioned that so it's you don't have a haptic feedback but i think the brain especially if um, if you're an experienced microsurgeon the brain has the feeling that you feel it so it's like a sea feel you have to develop and after a certain time um, it feels like you feel it because the brain i think the brain adapts to it what what the eyes see so so we have um, operations where it took longer, we had problems, but in general, it got much faster. And robots actually have been used before, about 10 years ago. There um, was a surgeon in Strasbourg here in, in Europe. He tried the Da Vinci for microsurgery and tried to do um, a microsurgical anastomosis, um, but it never really um, 
was used in the clinic because it was so difficult. So here, if you compare it, it took much longer. So it took about two hours to do it with the Da Vinci and the, um, our robot, the Sumani, in the longest case is about half an hour. So even in the worst case, it's still faster, I think. And also compared to the Musa robot, that's the other one, um, it's similar. So it's maybe a little bit faster in some instances, but um, yeah, it's about, I would say the same. So we, we evaluated the first 22 patients. So in the beginning, it was a little bit sobering because the Sumani was of course not as fast as we were with our hands and with the same number of stitches. But um, if you compare the first 11 to the second 11, we saw already a significant increase um, as you can see here, um, in the time needed, even though hand was still faster. But if you increase the number, um, about 50 anastomosis, um, Sumani is still slower than hand, but especially for small vessels, um, especially for the LVA, we've seen really that we could approach with the Sumani <clears throat> the times we have with, with our hands. So about the last 18 cases of 72 anastomosis we evaluated, we were about the same, about 10 minutes on average for lymphovenous anastomosis. And this time factor is often discussed. Um, I could just give you an impression here, the so lymphovenous anastomosis, why it may be in the beginning difficult, because the, the, this robot will not grab the stitch and it will, you know, stick and it will not pull and you you know, this is, I think where you use the time and uh, compared to a hand, of course, you're used to working with your hands, you used to know, you know how to do the stitches, but be sure it will improve with time. And these are also things to consider. So I think it's very important to have a nursing team that really knows how to use it and how to drape it because it takes some time to do it. And um, so if this is a team that specialized, you will not lose that mu as much time. We also have problems here in Switzerland. Our OAs are not so big. They're like from the 70s sometimes. So we have problems with all the devices in the room. Sometimes we have two microscopes and a robot and not and a laparoscopic setup for the momentum harvest. So we really have to see how we get everything in and out of the room. So that can be a problem. And also, of course, there can be technical issues that sometimes cost time, especially in the first, um, yeah, first year that we use the robot, but it also has been improved. So by now we have about 100 anastomosis. And as you can see, we did mostly LVA. This was our uh, focus lymphatic, arterial anastomosis, mostly lymph node transfer. Um, some nerve co-optations. Um, yeah, I don't think it's really helpful. It depends maybe on the area where you do it. If you do it in a deep wood, it may help. And one colleague tried a venous anastomosis. Usually the veins we coupler because it's very safe and fast. So um, patency is always very good. Um, and there can be very yeah, large differences depending on how much um, yeah, problems you can have one day. Sometimes the robot doesn't work, so it takes longer, or it can be very quick, as you can see here. But mean time for these was about 20 minutes, so for all the cases. And um, just wanted to show you um, how we approach lymphedema here in Zurich. So we, like most, I think most centers worldwide by now, are, um, have a combination approach. So we really like the gastroepiploic lymph node because um, it really does have a very low donor site mobility in our hands. And we combine it with LVAs depending on the lymphatic vessels quality and also liposuction, of course. So the omentum in our clinic, it's harvested by the um, visible surgeons. They, they're really good at it by now. They, they can do it in about 45 minutes to one hour. It's all laparoscopically. They never had to convert yet. And we really have not seen any donor side lymphedema or any problems also with the gastrointestinal tract. And of course, you don't have any seroma, um, really not. And it has really well vascularized tissue. It can be difficult because the pedicle can be very small, as you can see on the left. So usually they take out a piece of fat tissue and we have to go look for these really small vessels. So that can be challenging. It can be fragile. And of course, you have abdominal surgery, even though really we do not see a lot of problems with it. And so for us, I think this is a very good publication about the lymphatic vessel quality during the development of lymphedema. So if you have like a severe lymphedema, the vessels, the lymphatic vessels 
are nearly like obliterated and you cannot really use them. So lymphatic surgery probably works best in the, in the ecstasia type or like in the first stages one or maybe early two, where it's still lymphatic within the vessels. And this is the problem with the lymphosclerosis either because of the primary lymphedema that get worse or the secondary because of the pressure and the fibrosis, they also um, deteriorate the vessels over time. So in our, in my hands, I have the feeling in primary lymphedema, usually sometimes the lymphedema is not as bad as the vessels already are because the vessels somehow maybe are the reason for the problem. So that's a little bit different in secondary lymphedema. If you're early in secondary lymphedema, usually the vessels are, um, are good and then you can really also repair it um, with uh, lymphovenous anastomosis. So we also always look a little bit about how long the time is that the lymphedema already is present. And the um, mental flap, it's really good because it can be um, uh, it can be split and you can really um, transplant lymphatic tissue to two locations, two legs, maybe two ankles or one groin, one ankle. And I think one uh, concept why it works is because this tissue will work like, like a sponge. It will drain the liquid right away if it works and transport it into the venous system. So if you have it in two locations, some, I think it will help to drain the, uh, the lymphedema faster. So we usually put it on two locations. So this, for example, is an end to side to the posterior artery at the ankle. And um, yeah, you can see the omental flap on the right side. Um, this is just a standard lymphovenous anastomosis, also done with a robot, um, as you can see on the right side. And for the lymphovenous anastomosis with a robot, um, it's really helpful because you don't feel so much, especially in the beginning. And we also, have, I have learned the technique in Japan um, to use this IVA stand, so to really stabilize the vessel in such a 6 or 7 or proline suture. And then it's easier to suture the vessel around and you also are sure that your lumen is open if you don't see it that well, maybe. And so um, that works quite well with the robot. So here you can see anastomosis done with the robot, which is very patent. And maybe another impression of a, a mental flap. So the vessel, it's, it's not so small. It's probably around 1.5 to 2 millimeters. But it's in the, if it's in the axilla, it's a small uh, wound and a short pedicle. So in my view, it has an advantage. And also, if you work with two surgeons and two microscopes, sometimes you can really work close to each other if you use the robot on one um, side because you can sort of move, move out of the way so the other surgeon can operate conventionally. So this is a setup for um, axilla lymph node transfer um, where we use the uh, Sumani a lot and really, really love it because you can't really have an assistant there. No, they can sit nowhere so you can cut yourself, you can suture it and um, it's good. And here again, so that's the exoscope from our microscope that we use. It's a Kinevo from Zeiss, works quite well. And yeah, here you see anastomosis. So just some typical cases. I'm sure there are surgeons in the audience, you all know this. So it's a lymphedema um, momentum. It's really a functional repair. You can see patient almost wears no, more, no compression. Of course, it's a very good case. Not all cases are like this. It's, it's a lot of um, patients still need compression and we cannot really cure the disease also. But she really, you can see the veins on the back of her foot or also this patient um, after a lymph node transfer to the axilla. So especially on the hand, I always think that's the important area where you can really see if you reconstruct a lymphatic flow because this cannot be liposuctioned. And if this is going down the swelling, it's really a functional repair. And um, yeah. It's also a um, yeah, momental flap done with the Sumani. So in conclusion, we, we really like the momental flap. We almost do only this one for everything if we can do it. Um, it's low, low donor site mobility, no risk of extremity, lymphedema. And um, yes, it's um, also feasible to treat primary lymphedema uh, in our view. So we, for the primary lymphedema, we do a lot of um, uh, momental transfer. So, Let's move to the second part of the talk. So I have been talking about the arms and legs and the um, peripheral surgery. So the question is, what about the central lymphatic system? So yeah, this is the periphery. 
and this is the central system. So there are the lumbar trunks. So after the inguinal lymph nodes, there will be the, um, the, the um, iliac lymph nodes, the lumbar trunks, and then it will all join. There's the cisterna chyli, which is sort of like a bigger sac of lymphatic fluid, and then it goes into the thoracic duct. And the thoracic duct will travel up next to the spine through the thorax and normally enter the venous system at the left venous angle in the neck. And if you compare peripheral lymphatics to central lymphatics, they really look similar. Why, why, why wouldn't they? So, of course, this is the child six months old, looks like a peripheral lymphatic um, in an adult. So, it's about nine millimeter, um, 0 0.9 to 1 millimeter. And uh, of course, in adults, the thoracic duct is bigger, um, but still it's hard to access. So it, it, usually it's about maybe three millimeters in adults, so that's easier. But a lot of the patients are children. So it will still be micro to super micro surgery in these cases. And the story with the thoracic duct is that really it's sort of a hidden thing. It's inside the body and it has a very complex embryology. So in the beginning, usually, in the in utero, in the in the embryo, there are actually often two thoracic ducts and one obliterates. And depending on how this uh, works out, there is a very high variability of the um, lymphatic system in the adults. So it's not the same, and it's very variable, and that's why it's so uh, interesting and also complicated. So you can have all these: you can absence, you can have malformations, you can have duplications, you can have different causes, and um, yeah. So it's, um, it's complicated, but um, so if problems occur, usually what's happening and we as surgeons don't even see the patients often. So if there's a leak, for example, which can happen after esophagectomy or head and neck surgery or traumatic, they will go and embolize the leak. They puncture the cisterna chyli in the abdomen and they put coils in and um, they sort of, yeah, they seal the leak. So as you can see here, our radiologists do that all the time um, and it's fine. But there are patients where this doesn't work or it will cause problems. And this has also been, I think, neglected for a long time, but these patients will develop lower um, extremity lymphedema and especially in this protein using enteropathy, which is, a loss of protein over the intestines because the lymphatic flow is blocked. And um, these patients, they cannot be treated by embolization. They really actually need, need reconstruction. So this was actually how we got into this whole topic here in Zurich. So that's about five years ago. Our, I had an ex-surgeon, they had a patient, they had to do a um, tumor resection, they resected the um, internal jugular vein, and they sort of cut the thoracic duct during doing this. And they found out because Kai was coming out of the, of the wound of the neck. And they first, of course, asked the interventional radiologist, but they said, they cannot obliterate it because she, he didn't have a cisterna chyli. And so he had this leak, they tried everything, conservative therapy didn't work. So since the wound was already open, they asked us if we could do uh, open revision and maybe clip it or even yeah, reconstruct it. So this is a straightforward case. It's a patient with a healthy lymphatic system. Um, you can find a vein usually in the neck, external jugular vein or also other veins, parabed veins. And the, if you find the thoracic duct, um, which can be found by marking it with ICG and so on, um, you can connect it and then you have a chylus washout and then the problem is, is solved for the patient. So if you, if you just clip it, often it can cause problems. Yeah, well, you never know, but it's probably better to reconstruct it, I would say. So it's complex. We, we have a group working on this in Zurich and also in cooperation with the uh, University of Bonn in Germany. Um, so we also published uh, um, some paper about it, um, how to treat colleagues, um, if you're interested in the topic. And um, it's, it's even more complicated usually. Most, most of these patients that are coming to us, they have these... Um, lymphatic malformations or developmental problems with lymphatic system. And many of them are children. So they are born with problems. They have chylotorx, they have um, chylocytis, they have um, high mortality, all this protein loss. And it's not really something there 
to treat it or to reconstruct it. So there are medications that have been used for lymphatic malformations, serolimus, MEK inhibitors, and so on. They help, but if it's really blocked or clogged, as you can see on the image on the right, um, it's, it's really not so easy to reconstruct. So the thing is, these things can also happen when you're an adult. So some of these malformations go unnoticed until pe people get older and all of a sudden they get this problem. So this woman, um, she had a calothorax that was impossible to treat. So she had all kinds of surgeries, as you can see up here, and she had diets and weight loss and lung injuries and lung resections and all kinds of complications from all these operations. So the, um, the doctors in Germany asked us if we could do something for her. So you can see here that the thoracic duct actually is blocked and it's really um, dilated. So that's also sometimes a sign that something is not normal with the lymphatic system because this, this dilation is really also a problem with the peristalsis often of the, of the thoracic duct as we see, I'll show you later some more images. So um, since there were no other options, we thought we'd give it a try. And the first idea was to enter, uh, to exit the thoracic duct and maybe a vein next to it, a zygous vein um, through the thorax, but it was so scarred that it was not possible. So then we went to the abdomen below the diaphragm, as you can see on the left. And there you can already see some not normal lymphatic vessels. They're like dilated. And um, so probably it's something also that she was born with. Um, but we found a thoracic duct. It was very scarred. But after all, the lumen was not very big. But we also found a vein which drained into the cable system and uh, we could connect it. And actually, she was fine after that. So she didn't have any problems anymore. She gained, she, she could walk only one pneumonia, but she, she was sort of cured. But there are also more difficult problems. So this young man, he has, um, he had a also spontaneous um, kylaskos and also had all kinds of treatments, drainage, he lost weight, protein loss, and he also has a very dilated thoracic duct, as you can see here. So you sort of can suspect that it's, it's also something else wrong, except for the fact that it doesn't really drain into the venous system. So that makes it more difficult to treat these patients. Anyway, we thought we can try maybe to improve the flow and really intraoperatively. So this is at the neck. Um, you can see that it's like a cystic mal malformation of the thoracic duct junctions, as you can see on the left. And um, the duct itself was like a big cyst, like an aneurysm. And we could connect it to a vein, that was possible. So technically, I think it was possible. But the, the flow of the, of the chyle has to go into the right direction. So if the thoracic duct is like dilated and doesn't really pump that well, it's not so easy. So if there's lack of tonus and peristalsis, you can even have a backflow from the venous system. Of course, you can add an um, interposition graft with a valve. That's something that we do now, or we use veins that have valves. Um, but he, in the end, he was much better. He had reduced calascus, he gained weight, and he also had adjuvant therapy. But it's just to show you, it's a complex system. And this is another case, a child, six months old child. Um, and she had also um, thrombosis of all the veins of her neck and um, chest and um, supposedly no um, thromb thrombotic disease. They checked everything, no coagulopathy. And um, she really was blown up. The whole body was like a big, huge lymphedema. And also the colleagues asked if we could do something. So also here, something that has to be taken into consideration is the venous pressure in the system. So if there's a high venous pressure, it may not be that easy to drain, if, even if you can do the lymphovenous anosomosis. And also she had a, like a severe head and neck edema. It was not easy to access the neck, but still it was possible. And here is the thoracic duct that I showed you already. We could do um, like um, antograd and retrograd lymphovenous anastomosis and also connect some large collectors. And she actually, she, she got better. So the protein loss was better right away. No more substitution necessary. She was back in Germany with the doctors there. And um, she really, they wanted to extubate her. But unfortunately, after six weeks, um, she um, had a bleeding complication after thrombolysis because she again had a thrombosis of the inferior vena cava. So she died. Um, but so it has to be questioned whether there was no correlation uh, disorder, but still um, it helped at least for, for a certain time period. 
And there are other patients. So this is the patient, she has a known um, disorder, 30Q deletion. And um, this is how the MRI looks like in the lymphogram. So it's a lot of backflow, especially in the neck and the thoracic duct. It can be seen on the MRI here, but we don't really see it that well. So the plan was because she had massive swelling of the tongue and the head and neck and also of the lung, she, um, whether we could improve it by doing lymphovenous anastomosis in the neck of the thoracic duct. So for this, it's a technique that's very useful is to inject a lymph node in the groin by the radiologist here of our department, and they can inject ICG. And then you can actually see it here if you operate in the neck. So in this case, although it was complicated, so she had obviously spontaneous lymphovenous anastomosis because this is already a vein. We didn't do anything. It just showed up in the vein. Um, but she had all these kind of convolutes of lymphovenous anastomosis in the neck. We were looking for the thoracic duct. We looked everywhere. We didn't find it. So we did uh, lymphovenous anastomosis of three bigger collectors of lymphatic vessels that we could find. And actually she had a surprising result. Her mother, uh, who's taking care of her, was really happy or is happy. She just um, wrote an email that actually she's better. So she has reduced edema, tongue, throat, lungs, which was the biggest problem because she always had these problems with the PCO2. She had to use BPAP. She now has better PO2. She can drink, she can speak better. So, and also the problems of the lung are improved. So sometimes you also don't really know what is going on because it's not really you know, published so much about it, but for her, at least it helped. So yes, there's a whole other group of patients that um, has to be discussed. So there's um, patients after heart surgery where often the thoracic duct either is transected, they had so many um, operations, or they have a high venous pressure, for example, like this patient is a patient after Fontan surgery, uh, which all have these lymphatic problems. They have lymphedema, they have protein grooming enteroplasty, it's very common. And of course here, in this, as you can see on the right, it's a congestion and a retrograde stasis of the, the chyle and the lymphatic fluid from the extremities. So probably in this case, you can suspect that it is a transaction of the thoracic duct in the thorax. So, here also the question, can we reconstruct the flow? Um, it's not simple because these patients are really, really complicated. They are sick. They have a single ventricle. It's all a passive system, how the heart works. So the anesthesiologists, they're really uh, scared and, and concerned to operate these patients. And this patient, um, we decided to go for it because she suddenly developed five years ago, this severe lymphedema, as you can see on the bottom. So we, it was really to be suspected. It was transected. It was not only a venous backflow problem because of high frontal pressures. And she actually did have quite good frontal pressures in her, in her system. So we, we decided to do a lymphovenous astomosis in the abdomen. So this is done together with the visceral surgeons and they, we um, mobilized the duodenum and the pancreas here. And you can see the thoracic duct on the left. So it's sometimes not so easy to identify, but we also use the ICG injection. And this is uh, connected to the ovarian vein, um, which is actually quite a good vein for this because it has a valve usually at the junction to the renal vein on the, on the left side. This patient also had added CETOS ambiguous, so it was even more complicated, but in the end, we could do that. And um, this is quite surprising that she really quickly drained all the fluid from the legs and also beginning from the intestines during our stay with us. She's also from Germany. So something is working. So story goes on. This is two months post-op. She came back, she was great, she was happy, but the doctors, they had a problem. Maybe the heart function was getting a little bit worse because it's an extra fluid load. So I think this is something we have to keep in mind. We did a lymph angiography and you can really see a flow into the venous system, which actually drains here via the azygous system. Um, it cannot really be seen in the cava. We're speculating maybe the flow is too high, but for sure it's not congested anymore. It's entering the venous system, um, but it can also cause problems. So I think it's something we really have to work in to, to anticipate the next time to, to, to strengthen the heart, maybe give her different medications. But um, yeah, she's, she's good now, she's better now. But um, yeah, this is an interesting um, thing to learn. So 
This is a case, like the first case we know we did with a robot. And this also a very strange story. It's a woman, she's a nurse, and she couldn't walk for, she couldn't walk like a few meters or 50 meters and she, she would get abdominal pain and she would faint. So really weird story, I think. Nobody really believed her. She also had sort of a lipidema, no really lymphedema of the extremities. And she had a, um, like a dilation of the lumbar trunks. Um, and um, the, so the lumbar trunks enter this dilation, the cyst that you can see here, and then it flows out and the thoracic duct was normal. So the radiologist didn't want to embolize it because they say we can make it worse, she can get lymphedema, it doesn't work. And also it has been tried in a smaller hospital. So the question was, can we do something for her? So it's again, as you can see the intranodal ICG injection is really helpful to find the cyst. So this is the small laparotomy. This is this dilation with the ICG. You can see it here. It has the lymphatic fluid in it. And here we could really make use of our robot. I mean, in the end, this is not super small, I agree, but it's really helpful to have a robot to work on the small vessels. So we did an anastomosis to the cyst. And, um, sorry. Um, yeah, the, the patient was fine afterwards. So she went home, she says, yeah, it's great. I'm like a new human. I can work. Um, yeah, she, she said it's totally gone. The pain is gone and also the fainting is gone. And here we also try to visualize it because we also ask for it, even though it's not easy because of the flow. The vein is much higher than the contrast agent in the lymphatics. But in the end, you can see here the, um, the vein where we connect it to. It's also the ovarian vein. So it could be seen entering the, the renal vein. So it's open. Yeah, so I'm already at the end of my presentation. So um, robotic microsurgery, it's a new topic. I think it's a very promising topic. We have to find out at the moment what it's good for. So we don't know what it in the end will be used for, but it's really, in my view, by now for sure clear, it's, it's helping to do anastomosis, especially super micro anastomosis and deeper wounds where you cannot reach with your hands. So you have to work with your fingertips, otherwise thorax abdomen. Probably also bet um, a good thing to access the central lymphatic system, also for future um, and very very small vessels, um, perforators, lymphatics. Uh, probably need better microscopes as well, but doing the same development as a robot, smaller needles and so on. Um, yes, and then there are all these future things like more minimal invasive surgery. Um, you can do maybe flap harvest that only take perforators and you can make these anastomoses more secure um, using the robot, for example, and then in the end also topics like telemicrosurgery, for example. So um, we also published papers about it, um, if you're interested or you can contact me. And um, I thank you all very much um, for your interest in this presentation. And I'm happy to take questions. So let me see. I think I will start with some questions here. So the first question is, um, how many sutures do you use per anastomosis if a diameter is around one millimeter? Um, so this would probably be a lymphatic, could also be a perforator. Mm, I would say it's maybe between five or six sutures. And the suture is uh, it's a 11-0 suture usually for lymphatics. They're also 12-0, but they're at the moment hard to um, get in Switzerland. So usually the needle is quite big. So I think there's room for improvement to, to do smaller needles also in the, future, in the future for smaller vessels. How do you find patients that are good candidates for successful surgery for lower extremity lymphedema? What is the criteria and pre-op testing required? Yes, so this is about um, lymphedema surgery. So it's a topic, I think at the moment, it's still not 100% um, clear or there's not 100% consensus what really is the best method to find it out. So um, what we usually do is um, we, we do a lymphocentigraphy. I think that's a standard to uh, measure the lymphatic flow and also to diagnose lymphedema. The angiologists do it in Switzerland, so they often use it. Um, then we... Um, if the patient has a lymphedema, um, a second method 
so you cannot really see the lymphatic vessels with a, with a um, scintigraphy. It's only like a, a functional measurement. So to better see lymphatic vessels, there is lymphatic MRI. Um, however, it's not established in so many centers, I would say. It's also not an easy um, exam to perform. It's very difficult to do for the radiologist. So to do really do, the, do a good peripheral lymph MRI. Um, but if you have a um, radiologist who can do it, it can be helpful. And of course, ICG. Um, but ICG is, is only for lymphedema um, if it's not as severe because it only has like a depth of um, that you can see about one to two um, centimeters. So if the lymphedema is severe, it's not really good. And then, of course, a new method to use is ultrasound um, to do lymphatic ultrasound to find areas for lymphedema anastomosis. And then it's really a question for us, how long has the lymphedema been there? Um, is it already fibrotic? Does it have a lot of fat tissue accumulated already? It's very different. Is it 20 years old or is it only uh, two, two years old? It's different. So it depends really, because in these cases, often you cannot do lymphedemous anastomosis and it has to be lymph node transfer plus liposuction, for example. So it's, um, it's really different um, factors we have to take. Um, into consideration, then also is it primary, is it secondary? Do you see, what do you see in your diagnostics? And then you can make a treatment plan. But in general, it's a combination often of different um, topic, uh, different things. So often liposuction is also involved in the later stages of lymphedema, I would say. Um, so I go to the next question. How do you investigate blockage with this probably above groin abdominal cavity? Yes, so that's actually, uh, easier than doing it on the extremities, at least from what I know from the radiologist. So if you want to look at the abdomen, you can either do a conventional lymph angiography, um, where the radiologist puncture a, a lymph node or a lymph vessel, and they use uh, like contrast agent and they do an x-ray. Or the even better method is to do a lymph um, MRI. And also with um, puncture of a lymph node in the groin by ultrasound, and they inject the gadolinium in the lymph node. And all these nice images I showed you uh, are lymph MRIs, and you can really, really see um, the, the lymphatic vessels as, as I showed you. So it's, I think it's not easy. You have to really reconstruct the images. There are centers that are um, specialized. For example, Dr. Pieper in Bonn, he's really, really good at it. He makes great images, and you can really understand where the problem is. So. Yeah, so it has to be a specialized radiologist, I think, to do it. Yes. Um, so next question, how long it takes for a mental flap to take radionuclide with scintigraphy after lymph node transfer? Yeah, so um, the mental flap, usually we, if we do, we do the, the scintigraphy or the, the, the follow-up examinations, we only do it like after one year, the earliest. Um, usually we look for a clinical improvement. So um, I think in the clinical setting, for sure we can say the mental flap, if it works, it works very fast. So you can see improvement almost immediately because it will really act as a sponge, suck out the liquid and drain it into the um, lymphatic system. So it, it's not like this in every patient, but we had some patients where it's really, really fast and you, you don't even need a scintigraphy. You can see it just like clinically that the, the, the leg is really um, less swollen and it's really well drained. So it, it, it can work very fast. Yeah, I would say. Yes. Um, next question. I am. Yeah. yeah, so it's a question whether the lymphatic system is different from organ to organ, for example, spleen and thymus, or do they function in the same way in cancer patients? Yes. Hmm. Very hard to say. We, we don't really, I, I don't know the lymphatic system of the spleen. I know there is a system in the liver for sure. A lot of lymph is drained via the liver. And we know they all have lymphatic vessels in a way, but 
the exact differences, no, it's not really well studied, I have to say. So um, we know for sure that all the organs do have a lymphatic system. So by now, the newest thing is we know the brain has a lymphatic system. So for a long time, it was said, no, there is no lymphatic system in the brain. Now there were like publications, really good publications showing a lymphatic system in the brain. And of course, it's discussed, what could we do? Could we treat Alzheimer with lymphovenous anastomosis and so on? That's also at the moment a, a hot topic. So yeah, I think a lot of room for, for research yeah, regarding the lymphatic system. Um, yes, a totally very good question. <laughs> what is the medio economic model to justify the investment into the robot to our institution and the exec? Absolutely true. It's, it's not easy. So at the moment, I'm also discussing with our uh, CEO and uh, yeah, our uh, executives how to justify it economically. So I think, honestly, at the present time, you have extra costs. I don't see how you could in the learning phase that we're now in the investigative phase where you have to try it out, you're still establishing a learning curve, as I showed you how you could say we are faster or we are whatever, we don't have the extra cost because it costs. It's a single use set, you have extra cost for every operation. It's not a lot, but still it extra cost. So you have to convince them that you wanna be future oriented and that we have to go forward in medicine and improve um, operations for the patients, make them less invasive and be part of it. I think at the moment that's, the argument argument we have and that then we can also implement it into the insurance system that's what we are doing at the moment try to get it into the coding system that it will actually also be reimbursed and to show that it's less invasive and has good and better results so yeah so that's all i can say at the moment so um yes um so one more question The interventional radiologist failed the problem of contrast backflow doing MRL and the contrast failed to travel integrate. Yes. No, I just can tell you that our radiologists and also other radiologists are really, it's not easy to do it. So it has to be taken up by the, um, by the lymphatic vessels. You have to inject quite a lot uh, into the foot. And if it doesn't travel or it's not picked up, it's not so easy to do. Also, another thing is that um, the vein, the venous signal is always on top of the lymphatic signal. So that's also difficult or it goes into the veins and you don't know which are the veins and the lymphatics because it's taken up by the veins. So um, it, it's really something the radiologists have to develop or work on it with the sequences they're taking. It also takes a lot of time. That's also one thing. Not easy to tell the radiologist to do it if it takes two hours. They block their MRI and they say, yeah, we could do like five other patients in that time. So. Yeah, it's, um, it's still also developing, I have to say that. Um, in the U um, this is a question about the US. Yes, so um, in the US, there, um, there is a team at the University um, of Pennsylvania in, um, in Philadelphia. Um, there's um, Dr. Itkin, he also has given talks here, and uh, Dr. Uh, Kovac, he's a plastic surgeon, and Professor Scott Levin, and they, they are also doing this kind of surgery, and we, we are in contact with them, so, um, so you, if you have a problem, you might contact them, and um, yes, we, of course, we also work with U.S. citizens, but they are also the center in the U.S. you could contact if you have questions about that and especially the central lymphatic system. So they are specialized on that. Um, does injecting ICG in inguinal lymph nodes show up in the thoracic duct? Yes, absolutely, it does. It, it shows up in the thoracic duct for sure and in the neck if you inject it. Mm, depends a little bit on how, how blocked the system is, but if it's a normal system, it takes five minutes or so. Um, usually we see it after 10 to 15 minutes. Um, in the neck, you can see it, yes, with the ICG camera. So that works quite well. Yes, so he is a patient and is asking about likely outcomes from LVA um, after lymph node removal for cancer surgery, um, probably in the axilla. Yes, so outcomes, 
they are, so we cannot cure the lymphedema in most cases. I have to say that um, depending on the stage or how severely it's swollen and depending on the diagnostic and what you apply, I think especially in the upper extremity, we can get quite an improvement. So many patients, if you combine lymph node transfer, lymphovenous and even liposuction, they get almost like a reduction of, of the excess volume. Also we had these cases um, or at least a significant improvement, especially in the arm and after um, surgery, so secondary lymphedema. What is more difficult is the legs, primary lymphedema in the legs, more difficult. So that's a totally different story. The lymphatic system is not normal before, so you have to apply different concepts, I think, and that's also more difficult to treat. But still, most of patients get improvements, softer tissue, less compression, uh, a reduction of volume. So pati our patients are very uh, satisfied with the results and they know we cannot you know, cure it completely. And then if they know it, they're really happy with the results. Um, so we have a lot of questions. Yes, so I'm asked, yes, I have my email. Yes, of course, my email, it's on the last slide or um, maybe we can show it again. So you can also find me on the website of the University Hospital of Zurich. There's my email, it's uh, simple. Um, yes, so there's a question if we accept patients from non-Switzerland. Yes, we do. Uh, in fact, a lot of patients you saw are from Germany because it's not available in Germany, the, the, the central lymphatic surgery. So um, the, the, you can either, can, the patient can pay or sometimes even insurances of the different countries, at least European countries, they will accept to pay um, for the operation in Switzerland. So that has to be seen in every individual case, I would say. Um, so it's a question, do you do lymph node flaps other than momentum flaps? Um, yes, in the beginning we did um, um, groin, from the groin and also from the axilla or lateral thoracic wall. Um, we did a few cases of supraclavicular lymph node flaps and um, um, from the chin, uh, the flap, the sub, um, submental flap, but our patients usually, they don't like the scar in this area. They don't like the scar in the face uh, to take lymph nodes. So in the end, we arrived at the omental flap uh, and we almost only do this. And um, yeah, so because really it is um, straightforward and you don't have all these wound problems you can have with donor sites and drainage of seroma and so on and um, no secondary lymphedema that's very important for the patients yeah um, another question do you do LVA on late stage lymphedema patients yes so it depends a little bit on the um, diagnostic and also how the leg looks so usually in the late stage it's a lot of fibrotic tissue it's a lot of um fat tissue. Um, so I find it difficult. Um, I have heard that um, doctors who are very experienced with ultrasound by now, they say sometimes they can find suitable lymphatics and veins even in severe lymphedema. In my experience with the method we had up to now, I find it difficult. We always look uh, for lymphatics if we do the operation, but we plan usually the operation as a lymph node transfer or liposuction com combination operation. So, but I agree sometimes, especially on the foot or lower leg, there are sometimes are lymphatics that are still functioning and that could be connected. Um, yes. Yes, there's a question about lymph node to vein anastomosis. Yes. So I, I actually have done lymph node to vein anastomosis in the last month. And I, was, I found it quite convincing. So I had a patient um, who had a um, iliac lymph node removal for a gynecological tumor and she had lymphedema and um, all the lymph nodes in the world were patent. And uh, we, found the, we found a lymph node, we found a vein and the lymph node was actually also ICD positive. In the end, the lymph node appeared to be drained. Um, there was ICG in the veins. And I had the feeling like 
she had already like on the first day post op quite a good reduction of the severe edema of her thigh and her leg. So um, I don't have long term results, but um, we have to see. So there's a publication by JP Hong about it with a larger amount of a larger number of patients, and it sounds quite promising. So yes. So I had a, up to now I had a positive experience with lymph node venous. we will see how it goes. Genital lymphedema is a question. So yes, we also have a lot of patients with genital lymphedema. Um, so also here, I think if it's if it's in the early stage, we have very good experience with lymph or mental flap lymph node transfer in both groins and sort of like. Um, move the, the lymphatic tissue into the scrotum, for example, if it's a, a male, and it will right away also drain the fluid from the scrotum. We also operated children or a young, young boy with it. He was like 14, 15. He really was suffering from the lymphedema, and he is totally happy. Um, so for early stages, that works. I don't have, I don't really think lymphovenous, I don't know. I haven't been able to do lymphovenous astomos on a, on a genital lymphedema that really, really helped. And I don't know. I think the lymph node works good, works well. It can drain the fluid. And um, if it's a severe scrotal edema, for example, we also have been doing with the urologist really a section of the tissue and do a, a split thickness skin graft on the, um, yeah, on the, um, how do you say, orchid, on the testicles, testicles, that's it. So we, we, that's also what we did in very severe genital lymphedema in, in males. So that's also working, but it's sort of mutilating, but often better than nothing. Yeah. So that also works for female genital lymphedema, the lymph node transfer. Um, so there's another question. Full body lymphedema, but central lymphatic supposedly normal, um, according to imaging, phase is the worst. Yeah. I think that really has to, you really have to find a good specialist to find out what the problem is. So if all the lymphatic system, especially the neck is supposed to be normal, sometimes can also be other reasons for these edemas, like uh, certain enzymes that are not there um, that can make the swelling. Um, so it's, it's hard to say um, in general, but um, full body lymphedema sounds more like it's something, maybe it's not only lymphatic system, but of course it can also be something congenital, primary lymphedema. Um, often the face is not so much influenced. So I would probably go to an internal medicine doctor, angiologist, and try to find out what else could maybe be the reason for it. Not only like a lymphedema or a blocked system or primary lymphedema. It was a pleasure.